Shalom from Jerusalem. I'm Dan Dyker, president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I'm joined uh, by our senior colleague, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch, uh, advocate and former uh, prosecutor in Judea and Samaria, an expert in Middle East affairs. We're very honored uh, to have with us today two major international experts who we'll be bringing on in just a moment. Uh, one is uh, advocate ambassador, uh, 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 of former ambassador of, Can of Canada, Alan Baker, also former uh, adv legal advisor to Israel's uh, foreign ministry and uh, himself a former Oslo uh, Accord negotiator, and Dr. David Wormser, a fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs and the former Middle East advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, we're very honored to have both gentlemen uh, join us to give us the legal and international view of what is evolving here in this war against the Iranian regime back Hamas uh, organization that dominates the, the Gaza Strip and engaged in an unprecedented massacre on uh, Shabbat morning, Simchat Torah, uh, mass murdering children, women, civilians, and soldiers. The number, Maurice, extraordinarily, has reached over a thousand people dead, a thousand people murdered, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds simply massacred in, in the most barbaric, savage way. It was really reflective of middle, middle age, medieval uh, a type of uh, ISIS, then. ISIS, savagery, ISIS savagery, modern ISIS savagery. There's no other way to, uh, there's no other way to describe it. Uh, and the investigation goes on. At this point, uh, the IDF has engaged in very heavy retaliations over Hamas targeting directly uh, Hamas installations in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Attorney Baker will help us understand exactly how self-restrained and legally constrained the IDF uh, is and, and constrains itself in full comportment with international law. What we've learned since yesterday is this is the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs war, uh, Diplomacy War Center. Uh, and we are bringing you every day not only the updates, but the assessment, the analysis to create context and perspective to fight disinformation that is uh, being distributed, published and promoted across cyberspace by the Iranian regime and their proxies. And frankly, unfortunately, many affiliates in the West. And we're here to correct that uh, and fight that disinformation, give you the real story, the real facts uh, and the real context, perspective, and analysis from Jerusalem, uh, the capital of the eternal capital of the state of Israel. So we've learned since yesterday, been confirmed that 10 Americans have been killed and others captured uh, by the Hamas-led uh, by the, uh, the Hamas -led terror network in Gaza. Uh, the, the kidnapped and captured uh, victims in Gaza is a very serious story. And the United States and Israel are in very close touch about coordinating uh, actions in order to return the hostages uh, as uh, Israel deepens its counter-terror strikes deep into uh, Gaza. But as my colleague Maurice Hirsch said yesterday, this is no normal, regular, ongoing counter-terror operation. This is, a, this is a major war in order to decapitate, destroy, uh, and remove the Hamas terror network and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad network and the, the Fatah terror network from the Gaza Strip and hopefully to, to strike a major blow at the Iranian regime octopus, certainly the tentacles that stretch into the Gaza Strip, Maurice. Yeah, so let's give that a little bit of context. Um, we're talking now, traditionally over the last few years, there have been what Israel referred to and the world referred to as cycles of violence. Um, we're no longer in one of those cycles of violence. We're now in an all out war that has its own definitions, its own ramifications. Um, and it's things that we have to take into account. But let me just give you an idea of, of what this previous uh, uh, um, policy of Israel um, entailed. For example, Israel has for many years been trying to allow and help develop the, uh, the Gaza Strip to alleviate some of the uh, um, uh, and the difficulties there, allowing tens of thousands of Gazans to enter Israel to work. Those workers um, form some of the, let's just put it into, into numbers, 
402,763 entrances from Gaza into Israel just in the first eight months of the year, just up to August. These don't even include the statistics um, for September, which would have probably added, based on the previous averages, about another 60,000 um, um, entrances, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit less because of the Jewish holidays. Um, at the same time, Israel uh, uh, um, passing through Israel, Gaza has received, again, in the first eight months of the year, according all this according to UN statistics, so, and it's a UN organization which is particularly hostile to Israel, so these must be taken as, as at least the minimum statistics. Um, another 51,742 truckloads of goods that have gone into Gaza, only 4% of which, 4%, according to the UN, was humanitarian aid. The other 96% was not humanitarian aid, was, was designed to, uh, uh, um, for example, provided the Gazan terrorists with the Toyota vehicles that they then, then used to come across the border and slaughter Israelis. That's been Israel's policy uh, 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 until now. Um, that is undergoing now a, a, a fundamental change as a result of really the atrocities that were committed already on Shabbat. A thousand people that we now know have been murdered, 150 uh, approximately uh, kidnapped, American citizens, British citizens, uh, um, really citizens of almost every country, not almost every country in the world, but of many countries in the world. Um, that are now uh, uh, kidnapped in Gaza, dozens, Dan, of children and babies. Absolutely. Elderly, disabled, everyone's there. They're in Gaza. That's, that's where they're, they're, they're in Gaza, and, and, captured, and Hamas is, uh, at least uh, as of last night, was threatening to execute the, the, the hostages if Israel carried on um, in its defensive war. Um, that's what's uh, uh, going on. And there have been uh, atrocities, atrocities uh, that are indescribable that have taken place, particularly against women uh, in the in the Gaza Strip, which we won't go yeah. into in detail. But you, uh, I'm sure that our viewers and participants know exactly what we're talking about. I will mention that we are in the process of uh, of uh, bringing uh, becoming the major repository for a lot of the the toughest visuals out there. We're going to have. A, uh, a JCPA wartime diplomacy site in which we will be the we will hold a repository of very very difficult uh, visuals that we will warn you about, but we will add commentary to in order to create historical context for for the type of behavior that you're seeing uh, uh, on your screens by the terrorists. And we'll just say we were in touch with our sources in Gaza today, as well as our Iranian opposition sources, and it's become uh, evident that there were uh, Persian or Farsi uh, uh, language uh, operatives in this uh, onslaught. Uh, so there is a direct connection to the Iranian regime. And I think with that, we should turn to our guests uh, today. Um, uh, let, me, uh, let me first start, I, I think, with uh, Ambassador uh, and Advocate Alan Baker, who is a senior uh, director here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Uh, and has been a, the head of the Center for Contemporary Affairs and a great scholar, uh, a former negotiator at Oslo, former ambassador to Canada. Welcome, Ambassador Baker. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you see me? Because I can't see you. No, we, we, uh, we cannot see Ambassador Baker, but I know and appreciate your voice so much. Wait a second. We're going to have, we'll ask Daniel if we can uh, bring your picture onto the screen. Uh, and in in the meantime, I'll. Could you turn your video on? Alan? Is your video on, Alan? Yep. Oh, your video looks like it's off, according to what I see on the screen. Okay, just a second. Very good. I'm gonna. Uh... What's that? Oh, uh, there he is, Ambassador Baker. Uh, we the the main area of concern when we talk about the international community and the international media has been uh, these legal, uh, me these mendacious terms that have been tossed at Israel that have no legal validity, but nonetheless, they become part of the lingua franca of international law. Uh, 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 you've written a, a, a lot about this called you know, disproportionate response targeting children, women, and innocents on purpose. 
Uh, that's why it's very important uh, for us to bring you for the clear context and perspective on Israel's legal rights and responsibilities uh, as, uh, you know, in this major uh, military operation against the Iranian-backed Hamas. And the war crimes. Committed. And the war crimes that they have committed uh, over the last three days. Can you try to create a broad stroke context so that our participants have some intellectual and legal and moral uh, uh, weaponry that they can take away with them? Fine. Okay. Uh, just a, a couple of words of correction. Uh, I'm uh, not a former ambassador. I'm an ambassador. Uh, and I wasn't the, uh, Can the Canadian ambassador. I was the Israeli ambassador to Canada. Um, so that, that's just one, two, two okay. corrections. Yeah, we meant the Israeli ambassador to Canada for sure. Did okay, we say for the Canadian ambassador? Yes, uh, yes, that's what you said. Uh, never mind. Look, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, address um, uh, three or four uh, spheres. One is, what are the actual um, crimes that Hamas and the Islamic Jihad uh, have committed uh, over the past uh, few days? Uh, secondly, um, what can be done, um, practically speaking, uh, in the international community. And thirdly, what are Israel's rights in international law uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, reprisals or responding or self-defense? Um, and another question that, that exists is, uh, uh, does this uh, war enter into the, the uh, rubric, into the framework or the accepted definitions of a standard war? Because it's a war between a, a sovereign state and a terrorist organization, uh, uh, which is not a state. And, and, and therefore the question is whether the standard accepted definitions of, of uh, warfare, and what can be done in warfare, are applicable when you're dealing with a terror organization. Uh, and this is a very significant today in international law because a lot of the uh, wars, a lot of the armed conflicts that are taking place aren't necessarily between uh, uh, two states, they're usually between uh, one state and a terrorist organization. So first of all, uh, what are the actual uh, uh, war crimes that Hamas and the Islamic Jihad terror organizations have committed over the past few days? Uh, uh, first of all, the, the willful and indiscriminate firing of uh, almost 3000 rockets into Israel's civilian population. Uh, this is a very serious violation, first of all, of the, the internationally accepted norm of distinction between um, uh, military targets and uh, civilians. Uh, this is an absolute rule that when you're fighting a war in, in, in an armed conflict, you have to distinguish between innocent civilians and uh, legitimate targets. And if you target uh, indiscriminately uh, towns and villages and, and civilians, so this is a, a very, very major war crime. The second one is the, the willful, deliberate and hysteric massacre and execution of, of, uh, of civilians um, done indiscriminately, uh, pillaging of, of homes. All these are equally very serious and, 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 and uh, terrible uh, war crimes that, that invoke a, a criminal liability uh, according to international law. The third is, is the, the whole concept of hostage taking. Uh, to, to, to take hostages, um, women, as you said, women, uh, children, old people, soldiers, uh, uh, civilians, uh, uh, and to, to display them uh, in front of the, 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 um, the Gaza population in a very uh, demeaning and insulting manner, uh, including displaying uh, uh, dead bodies, uh, this, this is, uh, again, a, a very serious uh, violation of the, the, the norms and principles of international humanitarian law. Uh, the same with respect to desecration of the, the dead, exhibiting bodies. Uh, um, the, the, these are all things that are listed in the, not just in the various um, international uh, instruments regarding um, the laws of armed conflict, 
but they are listed also in the uh, statute of the International Criminal Court as uh, extremely serious uh, uh, war crimes uh, that, that invoke uh, criminal liability. If we're talking about um, the issue of, of uh, hostages, there's an international convention from 1979 prohibiting the taking of hostages or, and prohibiting any assistance to uh, uh, groups or people uh, or organizations that hold or take hostages. Now, we know that uh, uh, the Hamas leadership and the Islamic Jihad leadership are being hosted by Qatar. And Qatar is a, a party to this convention, as is Iran, by the way. Uh, and they're obligated not just to arrest uh, people who are holding hostages, but to uh, put them on trial or extradite them to, to, to uh, international tribunals or to countries that, that are prepared to put them on trial. So here, if in, in as much as Qatar doesn't uh, uh, fulfill its obligations according to this, uh, um, uh, this convention, there, there's a serious uh, violation of international law against Qatar. Um, so here we've, I, I've sort of gone through a, a, a series of uh, um, international war crimes um, that, that Hamas and, and Islamic Jihad have, have committed. Um, and um, all the question now is, okay, so what can be done about it? Yeah. It's, it's one thing just to uh, sit in front of uh, you all uh, and say this is terrible and, and, and uh, um, you know, this can't be suffered and, and, and one thing and another. But the question is, practically speaking, how, what, how can the international community and Israel uh, cope with this and what do we have to do? First of all, uh, uh, an interesting point that I heard today was that the, the thousand Israelis that have been killed over the last few days is the highest number of Jews killed since the Holocaust, uh, which is very, very significant and, 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 and very important uh, uh, to remember in, in, in discussing this, this whole uh, um, sad and terrible uh, uh, issue that we have. Now, what can be done? Um, first of all, uh, as I said, uh, I referred to the International Criminal Court, which, which, whose statute lists all the, these uh, violations and, and some form of initiation of a complaint, of a referral to the International Criminal Court has to be done. Now, this can be done by states that are parties to the statute of the Criminal Court, or it can be done by individuals or by um, non-governmental organizations, human rights organizations that can um, petition uh, the court, refer complaints to the court, and the court has the, the mechanism to, to determine whether these uh, petitions are uh, acceptable uh, and sufficient in order to open up a procedure of uh, investigation and uh, uh, leading to a, poss a possible uh, uh, formal uh, uh, prosecution against the people responsible. And this is another very significant legal point. Uh, you need to, to point to the people responsible because according to the statute of the International Criminal Court, the court doesn't deal with states uh, that commit uh, war crimes, it deals with individuals. So whoever are all these, this long list of uh, commanders of uh, the Hamas uh, uh, terrorist organization and the Islamic Jihad terrorist organization uh, have to be identified and uh, the complaints have to refer specifically to them. Uh, another uh, uh, route for action is the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, by, by their own uh, uh, international conventions, the Geneva Conventions, and before that, the Hague Conventions, defining their humanitarian task, uh, dealing with uh, uh, protecting hostages and helping to uh, uh, free hostages, and ensuring that hostages are uh, kept safely uh, and are not harmed. These are the major uh, um, functions of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And I, I would hope that uh, uh, both Israel, uh, the United States, 
and the European states and, and all those states who are observing what's going on and are concerned will we'll, we'll approach the International Committee of the Red Cross and demand that they fulfill their function uh, uh, urgently in order to uh, um, protect uh, the hostages and provide the ways in which to, to, to have them uh, returned, including also uh, the, the, the fatalities, dead bodies, and, and things like that. Alan, uh, can we ask you, um, what is the recourse of the international community, in this case led by the State of Israel, uh, in, the, uh, in the context of Hamas uh, as a FTO, uh, a recognized international foreign terrorist organization? What kind of international uh, UN or international organization, international court recourse do you have organizationally against these, uh, against these organizations? But look, as I said, the, the, the International Criminal Court deals with individuals, not with organizations. Uh, um, international law recognizes the fact that if a, 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 a terrorist organization participates in an armed conflict against a state, then that organization is, is bound by the norms and principles of international humanitarian law including all the, the long list of uh, 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 situations that I've mentioned. So um, in as much as Hamas has proudly, publicly and openly admitted that they're, they've instituted a war with Israel, then they're liable uh, uh, for, for um, crim crim criminalization of the, 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 the crimes that they've committed and, and uh, being brought before the various international tribunals or uh, individual courts of those countries that have universal jurisdiction to uh, uh, to, to put uh, war criminals on trial. Uh, another of the uh, actions that, that should be done by states is to put a, a huge amount of pressure on Qatar. Qatar is a, is a country that, that's trying to maintain its, its, its presence and its status as an accepted a state in the international community it hosted the, uh, the the world uh, the mondial the world cup of football uh, and it's trying to maintain an element of respectability while at the same time it's hosting encouraging financing uh, these terror organizations and a considerable amount of pressure should be put on qatar both by those uh, um, muslim arab countries uh, uh, that, that are uh, seriously concerned with what's going on now, uh, but also the members of the international community who are, have diplomatic relations with Qatar and ha are in a position to put pressure on this on, on, on Qatar. They have to, if they if they're not capable for their own uh, ideological ideological reasons of of arresting these leaders of the of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad terror organizations then they should get rid of them, um, deport them, and, and have them sent to, to uh, uh, any other country that would be prepared to, to take action against them. But if, if Qatar wants to be uh, considered as a serious country, then I think all other serious countries, whether it's the Europeans or the Americans or, or anybody that has relations with, with Qatar, should uh, uh, put very serious pressure on them uh, uh, with respect to the, the hostages, uh, with respect to uh, uh, dealing with those responsible for, for what's, what's been happening over the last few days. And finally, uh, Israel's, uh, what are Israel's rights, you asked, in, in international law? Well, of course, Israel has the right uh, of a reprisal, uh, a reprisal in self-defense, which is exactly what's happening at the moment. Uh, and Israel can can take whatever action it deems appropriate, as long as it, uh, the action that it takes are part and parcel of the, the, the norms and principles of international armed conflict and, and uh, directed against uh, uh, legitimate military targets. Now, because um, the whole of the infrastructure of Hamas in Gaza, uh, whether it's their uh, military infrastructure, whether it's, it's their electricity infrastructure and other uh, um, uh, frameworks are part of their uh, uh, military effort, uh, 
then Israel has got the prerogative to act uh, against any of, of these uh, uh, military targets, which is, as I understand, is what it's doing. Um, anything that, that serves as a contribution to the war effort by Hamas, even if it's a, a private home that, that, that houses uh, um, weapons, or even if it's, it's a school, where they store, where they're storing uh, ammunition, or if it's a mosque or a hospital under which they maintain a, a command center, or if it's a high-rise building uh, with uh, uh, antennas and, and uh, 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 equipment on on the roof, then all these are legitimate military targets, and Israel uh, can and should, and I hope is targeting them in a very serious manner, and any. A, a international organization or country that accuses Israel of, of, of uh, uh, violating the laws of armed conflict, they really don't know what they're talking about. And, and uh, uh, Israel shouldn't take this into consideration. Israel's, the first and foremost consideration of Israel should be to, to act against the military infrastructure in its widest sense of Hamas and, and the jihad, uh, and the Islamic jihad in Gaza Strip. So th this is where we stand from the legal point of view. I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody wants to ask. Wonderful, Alan, thank you ever so much. But I want to uh, remind our participants, uh, friends, family, and colleagues across the seas that Ambassador Baker's uh, uh, summary comments about Israel's legal rights and the massive violations of Hamas uh, uh, of international legal norms is on the is on our war uh, our wartime diplomacy center site right off the homepage. You can get uh, Ambassador Baker's comments that he summarized yesterday. And I will mention that Ambassador Baker is also spearheading a, a very important legal rights initiative called Israel Under Fire, uh, which actually uh, explains, assesses, and explicates everything that Ambassador Baker has said now. Uh, but in a very clearly written compendium form, that policy book will be out in the coming few weeks. Uh, and uh, we will be putting that on, on the site as well. You can find Ambassador Baker's articles at jcpa.org. And we'll put those articles that are relevant in, into the wartime diplomacy center site. So you'll have that as a reference guide. And uh, when we talk about international affairs, quick quote. Uh, you, you have a quick, quote? Quick word, if I may. Uh, um, I would just like to uh, uh, um, just, whilst I cannot uh, uh, um, disagree with uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Baker and his and his recommendations, I personally, Dan, have somewhat of a reservation um, for submitting um, complaints to the ICC. The ICC only recognise, while it doesn't uh, uh, um, put states on trial, it puts individuals on trial in order to be a member of the ICC, in order for the territory of a, a, or, or, or a certain territory to become under the to come under the jurisdiction of the ICC, you have to be part of a state. No state of Palestine exists now. Two years ago, the court invented the state of Palestine and added it into the in, in, into the into the court and gave it jurisdiction. And the prosecutor opened a, a, an investigation. But I fear that any uh, um, complaints that are submitted by Israelis to the court will only give the court ju uh, uh, justification. And, and almost the, the, the credibility to chase after Israel. No terrorist will ever be brought before the, the ICC, so I believe. Um, and so I would just say that that's something which needs to be uh, um, taken into account. Um, may, I, may I please uh, beg to, to, to differ? And I don't want to enter into a, a debate now uh, um, with uh, uh, Mr. Hirsch about uh, the ICC and the jurisdiction. I was involved in drafting the statute of the ICC, the Rome statute, and in negotiating it. And I'm full of humilia with what it's, what's written in there. And if uh, anybody, whether it, it, he, he or she is a citizen of a state, party to the ICC or not, if they carry out uh, war crimes, then they're liable to be uh, 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 prosecuted uh, and uh, by by the International Criminal Court, without going into the issue of whether Israel is or is not a party, uh, um, Palestine what, is a party. wherever they are, uh, uh, if they're in Kuwait or if they're uh, in in Iran or any other country, if they are 
uh, if a complaint has been issued against them uh, by, as I say, any country that is a party or any organization uh, or individual, then the court uh, can determine whether they, they can open, uh, whether it can open an investigation against them. But again, as I said, I don't want to get into uh, a debate about this. Uh, this is one of the major and only uh, uh, ways of dealing with serious war criminals. And, and therefore, uh, it, it can't be uh, dismissed out of hand and it has to be taken seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we'll continue this discussion because it's in, I think it's very important to delve into the even into the uh, the weeds on the international law because it's been so politicized. Alan, you've been writing, and both you and Maurice have been writing about the politicization, the buzzwording of international law that brings the discussion way out of the legal realm and into the cynical, political, mendacious uh, realm of defamation and delegi delegitimization uh, of Israel. So it's an important. Uh, uh, it's an important discussion to understand what our rights and responsibilities are. And when we talk about international affairs, I'd like to go over to Dr. Dave Wormser, uh, a, a new fellow of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, a former uh, foreign policy advisor uh, to uh, Dick Cheney, former uh, Middle East expert and advisor to former Vice President Dick Cheney, uh, and really one of the great experts on the Middle East and the Iranian file in uh, in Washington. Uh, Dave's in... in uh, Israel now uh, and doing some advising uh, of, uh, of different uh, leaders, both in the public and private sector. Dave, thanks for joining us. We want to talk to you, David, about the the what looks like an evolving expansion of this uh, conflict. Uh, it, it looks like, first of all, this is Iran, Iran, Iran. It's not about Hamas per se, even though they were the executioners uh, in, in a double entendre in this particular case. But, but you, Dave, as an expert on the Iranian regime, having been the point man on the Iranian regime for the Bush II administration, how do you see this evolving as there are already indications of uh, conflict and deaths uh, up in the north, opposite Iranian back Hezbollah? And how is this evolving uh, from, a, from a cooperation, collaboration point of view between Jerusalem and Washington? Uh Thank you, Dan. It's uh, a good question. Uh, first of all, I, I have to just commend uh, Ambassador Baker. I, I like the strategic way that he looks at international law and how Israel might employ it. I don't think very many Israelis are thinking about Qatar and others, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, now, uh, about the strategy and uh, diplomacy, which are different worlds to some extent in international law, of course, International law has to be has to be referred to, and it, and it has to be in the mind of of policymakers. But uh, let me lay out a strategic reality that Israel now faces, which is if it's been accepted in the region over the last uh, few decades, starting with Egypt in 1977, uh, going all the way to uh, the UAE in 2000, and hopefully soon the Saudis. These peace agreements, which uh, bring anchors of stability to the region and, and uh, orient countries toward the Western uh, cluster of nations, which also generally have respect for law, international law and so forth, that whole process is anchored heavily to the perception that Israel is solid, Israel is strong, Israel is not just a minion of the United States, but its own indigenous and powerful uh, resurrection. Uh, and and, and uh, the, that the victories of Israel and the various wars that preceded these peace treaties uh, generally have solidified that. Saudi Arabia, if it makes peace, UAE, when it made peace, it made peace with the assumption that Israel is a strategic partner and a strategic asset to them. That said, what happened on Saturday uh, was not only horrifying and uh, uh, stomach churning, uh, and 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 does definitely, uh, as the son of a psychiatrist, shows show the depths of human depravity. Uh, it is also strategically Israel looks weak. Israel has been humiliated, which means. From a, from a point of view of securing peace treaties, 
point of view of deterring or or somewhat dissuading nations from attacking Israel, from the point of view of convincing people in Europe and Asia and in the United States that Israel is here to stay and it is a solid winner. Uh, Israel has to emerge from this conflict in a way that is unquestioningly a victory. And that is a tall order given that Israel starting this conflagration uh, clearly uh, uh, defeated. Uh, so the question is, what does victory mean? And what is a sufficient victory uh, that, that, that would be uh, of enough scale that it erases or overpowers, transcends the initial humiliating defeat? Uh, clearly, to me, from a strategic point of view, there's no question that Hamas has to be eliminated in Gaza, and most likely a reoccupation of Gaza is the only way to do that. So I, I think that's that's a starting point. But let's imagine for a moment, and I, I realize this this is this will be a little disconcerting, but let's imagine for a moment that that happens, which which uh, one would one one imagines might be happening imminently. Uh, is that a sufficient victory? Uh, is that something that really will prove the point? And my answer is no, because what happened with Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad is part of a larger Iranian offensive in the region. Iran is on the march. Iran has been on the march for the last two years. It has, ever since its money began to flow again and sanctions have eroded, it has had the wherewithal to go back on the offensive. And we're seeing the consequences of that now. Now, I remember in 2006, Hezbollah was told by Iran to strike Israel. Uh, this was preceding the, the 2006 war. And there were many in Hezbollah who uh, argued to the Iranians, we have to be careful. The Israelis can be very dangerous. They're, they're, not, a, they're not a paper tiger. Despite what Nasrallah says, there were a lot of commanders, a lot of Hezbollahis uh, communicating with Iran, basically telling them, look, we, these guys are serious, these Israelis, you better be careful. Tehran, Ahmadi, under Ahmadi Najad at the time, made a very basic point. He said, you, Hezbollah, who at the time was reeling with the withdrawal of Syria from Lebanon after a UN resolution, you, Hezbollah, will not be able to resurrect your political fortunes properly inside the framework of Lebanon alone. You are derivative of the overall Iranian thrust in the region. And as a result, only by delivering a vic victory to the Iranian strategic stature will you be able then to bank and borrow from that stature to resurrect yourself and strengthen yourself back to, back to the levels that you need, if not much greater levels. So there's a fundamental uh, strategic pattern with all these organizations that are deeply tied to Iran, if not even operationally controlled to some extent, or at least operationally supported by Iran, which we know Hamas and Jihad, Palestinian Jihad are by their own admission. So. What these are are really events, geostrategic events designed to create an image of Iranian advance and, and rising. So the answer to this has to be uh, a similar uh, response by Israel. The strategic, the geostrategic momentum of this conflict has to be turned upside down right now the Iranians have made the Israelis on the defensive, the Israelis on their heels. The Israelis are, are, are right now uh, under question of solidity. The Israelis may, are, look like they may not be around. They look like, like losers to the Saudis and so forth. So for Israel to win this in a way that allows, Israel has to live here. So Israel must win this and it must come out of this with a perception of victory so that people who wanna make peace feel encouraged to make peace and see Israel as the horse to tie their cart to. And those who want to attack Israel will think twice or not even do it. And those in the West will say, well, Israel really is, you know, crossing 10 million, the, the, the startup nation, a miracle, solid as can be, 
uh, this is the place to deal with in the region. It's a pillar to anchor Western policy to in the Eastern Mediterranean. To get to that point, the victory has to be strategically changing, inverting, completely turning upside down the strategic image of defeat that we currently have. And I don't think that can be done unless this war, which started in Gaza, ends in Tehran. And now by this, I don't mean Israel goes and attacks Tehran. What I mean by this is that Iran's entire strategic uh, position in the region is anchored to Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah supports, the, you, it doesn't just support, I have to go, it's, there's a oh, siren. Got a Okay, yeah, yeah we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll talk. Uh, yeah, I'll, that's I'll, fine. You have a siren, I'll, an air raid siren in Tel Aviv. Keep safe, Dave. Yeah, so you have to go. You have to go down. Okay, so we're going to go back to Ambassador Baker for a minute. Uh, Ambassador, there is a BBC report today uh, that Israel's decision to disconnect the water, electricity, uh, and deliveries of other foodstuffs is a severe breach of international law. How do you see it? Uh, because Israel, in a way, since 2006, uh, uh, five, when it withdrew unilaterally, as Dave, there is Dave going down to the bomb shelter in Tel Aviv, uh, as, as Israel uh, withdrew unilaterally in 2005, there were many calls here for disconnecting Israel's uh, uh, water and utilities connections altogether, because it was kind of like being half pregnant, because they retreated and withdrew, but they didn't completely withdrew and withdraw in terms of choosing to supply uh, these uh, utilities and uh, continued deliveries of foodstuffs. Okay, look, first of all, we all know what the BBC is, and uh, I, I wouldn't um, relate any seriousness to, to what the BBC says, because their, their position is basically a, a position uh, which is very, very negative with respect to Israel. Um, Look, uh, according to international law, uh, as I said before, um, a party to a conflict has got the prerogative to attack uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, harm whatever may be connected to the war effort of the other side. And if this means uh, cutting off electricity to Gaza because uh, the electricity supplied uh, um, uh, services, uh, the command structure of the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, and provides uh, means for uh, building up weapons or, or, or producing rockets and, and, and these various things, then Israel has got every right uh, to attack uh, um, any of those, um, uh, any parts of that infrastructure but also to prevent the supply of electricity to that infrastructure. Uh, with respect to water, uh, similar. Uh, the one proviso that international law requires is that uh, you can't starve a population because it's, it's collective punishment uh, and, and it can't be done. But there's a, a, a huge distance between that and between targeting uh, um, um, services that uh, are, are adding to the war efforts of uh, uh, the terrorist organizations. Yeah, yeah. So, so therefore, if Israel claims that supplying uh, water and electricity would only benefit or primarily benefit the Hamas overlords and terrorists, then they can make the claim to disconnect it, even though there is a, uh, an ensuing consequential influence on the uh, population there? Look, uh, uh, I, I said before uh, that, that, that the situation is, a, is an unbalanced situation because it's, uh, it's a war not between two states that, that are bound by the laws of armed conflict. It's a war between one state that binds itself by the norms and principles, uh, customary international law, conventional international law, and, and prides itself in, in abiding by uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, rules and regulations, and, it, and between a terrorist organization, which by definition uh, uh, is proudly violates all these norms uh, uh, because it doesn't consider itself to be bound by them. And so this is a, a dilemma that Israel has to face. 
And uh, in facing that dilemma, it's our duty whilst trying uh, uh, to abide as far as possible by the norms of, of uh, international humanitarian law, if we need to, to uh, target something that uh, uh, contributes to the uh, uh, military effort by uh, Hamas or by the Islamic Jihad, then Israel has got every right and prerogative to, to, to do that. And we just have to try and find the, the balance so that it won't be seen to be a collective punishment against innocent civilians, but at the same time, it's vital to harm uh, uh, military infrastructure or whatever uh, services, whether it's electricity or water, that is contributing to uh, uh, to their military effort. Understood. Dave Wormsley, you're back, back in the cockpit. Can you, can you, yeah. Dave, can you, you want to finish your Yeah, no, I can uh, hear you, but we're, make a couple points. there's the shelter, you know, I mean, so slow, but the, the point I did want to make at the end there was, uh, given that the entirety of the Syrian regime really relies on, on Hezbollah and the IRGC through Hezbollah to survive, and uh, they're in, already with a great deal of revolt in the uh, Druze areas, in Suweda and so forth, which is not that far from the southern part of the Golan Heights in Israel, there is a very strong, if this war spreads to, to uh, Hezbollah, and frankly, it already has, Hezbollah has already done enough now to justify Israeli entry into war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've killed Israeli, a very senior, in fact, Israeli officer. They've infiltrated the border. They sent drones over over its spot, they have uh, shot mortars at Israeli positions along the border. So uh, the justification for an Israeli war of self-defense is there. The reason why I raise this is because Iran would suffer an immense strategic blow, an immense strategic blow if it, if it lost Syria or Syria was in such deep trouble that it would it would suck the Iranians dry. And worst of all for the Iranian regime is clearly the Iranian people are no longer on board with their regime. And, and populations like that and countries like that have an incredibly acute sense of smell of weakness. And if they feel that the Iranian regime is on a strategic retreat, uh, they, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm certain the Iranian people will give the Iranian regime a good run for the money. And then you would imagine that the war that started in Gaza ends with the Iranian regime existentially fighting for its survival in Tehran. That would be the level of geostrategic defeat. That, and, and I don't think much short of that, frankly, would be sufficient in order to erase and reverse the initial image of Israeli defeat that will haunt Israel for decades, unless it does have such a strategy. Israel needs a 67 level strategic victory right now. Yeah, that's what's required, you're saying, is the, is the, the level of 67 victory. That's what I, I'm saying it's required and, and the legit, I, I mean, I leave this to Peter Baker, but the, the, the Radwan forces have been mobilized. These are the forces of Hezbollah that do exactly what Hamas just did. That is their point. That is the very existence they've been mobilized deployed immediately opposite the Golan Heights. There have been crossings of the border. There have been these, the, right now, I, I mean, I am not an expert in international law, but there has been violent action against Israeli soldiers, Israeli towns, Israeli cities, uh, and Israelis have been killed in unprovoked attacks from the North. Rockets have been shot. I believe this suffices to legitimize the self-defense war. I want to turn to uh, our wonderful participants who have been very patient in uh, uh, being with us in this 45 minute uh, briefing. If they have questions or comments they'd like to throw into the chat, we have a few, just a few minutes left. We've gone over time, but we want, we definitely love, love to hear from you questions, comments. Uh, we have a really distinguished uh, team here, and we're doing this every day with, with a, a rotation of our. Uh, of our experts from intelligence, military, diplomacy, international law, uh, Arab affairs, international uh, Palestinian affairs as well. And uh, we will be 
sending emails out to uh, uh, to all of you. If you would, all of you on this call, if you'd send us your emails to jcpa at jcpa.org or even to us at diker at jcpa.org or to maurice at jcpa, M-A-U-R-I-C-E at jcpa.org. We'll put you directly, you know, on our list if you're not already on our list. Uh, and we will, you will see, we will be, uh, uh, we really will be buffeting up, um, uh, enriching our uh, wartime diplomacy center online right off the homepage. So you'll have a one-stop shop to get analysis, context, uh, assessment, uh, as well as the, the, the really important um, counter disinformation material that you need to understand exactly who who this enemy is and why they're so dangerous. And I'm talking about not only Hamas, but of course their paymasters and their financers and their, in, their inspiration, which is the Mullah and the IRGC in Tehran. Uh, this is a very important point that we wanna emphasize. This is an Iranian regime war, uh, as Dave mentioned, that expressed itself in 2006 with an instruction to Hezbollah to attack and they, in, in fact, took Israel a number of days uh, to recover from an initial blow in, this, in the towns in, in southern Lebanon in order to win that 31-day war. Uh, but, uh, but then again, the, the Western alliance led by the United States uh, had been buried in a conception that the Iranian regime was the answer to international terror. It wasn't the problem, and rather Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the international Salafi network was the problem. And on Saturday morning, Shabbat morning, Simchat Torah, that conception was massacred. So that what we want to do with the Jerusalem Center of Public Affairs is help us understand the, 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 the massacre and collapse, uh, the death of that misconception, which Israel also fell into, and uh, to, to raise new policy pathways to how to deal uh, in this part of the world uh, in which, which Israel rejoined back in you know, the 100 years ago, and even, and, and Jews have been here for 3,000 years, but I'm just saying as a collective, the modern political reality. So if we have any questions, ah, there is a question there from Dave. Uh, does Israel have the weapons of manpower for a six-day war level victory? All the reserves are called up. So what is what is left several months from now? Dave Worms, do you want to try that before I ask Alan? Um, yeah, well, one of the things I, you know, a lot of people have said, will America intervene? And I said, and I keep saying, no, it won't. And it's not necessarily in Israel's interest for it to intervene. And I'm, I'll get to why the, the resupply and weapons issue in a second uh, as part of this. Uh, if Israel's image is weak right now, the more Israel needs somebody else's help to, to win this, the more uh, Israel continues to look weak. Uh, and in fact, it reinforces and confirms the idea that Israel is not capable ultimately of defending itself and needs others to help come and help defend it. So I think actually, precisely because Israel was dealt such a blow two days ago, Israel must prosecute this war entirely alone. Mm -hmm. And it must win this war on such a massive scale entirely alone. It, is, it will not be in Israel's interest to use and get help operationally from the United States in that way. That said, Israel will need American help in two ways. One is that you have to have a you must differentiate between American support and American alliance and American intervention and American operational engagement. It, Israel is uh, clearly America's ally, and it is in the Middle Eastern terms they understand that there is a very real danger for Israel if America abandons Israel or turns on Israel. So any sign that there's light of day between Israel and America actually weakens Israel further. So the best thing is for America to be strongly for Israel, not question Israel, run cover for Israel in the United Nations, in the international courts, uh, and then to let Israel know that when the war's over, there will be resupply help. Uh, but during the war, it's imperative that Israel does this all alone. Uh, and I'm not even sure that it's a great idea to have too much resupply during the war as if Israel doesn't have strength. Now, that said, after the war, uh, the amount of missiles being anti-missile missiles, the Tamir missiles that go into the Iron Dome, 
they're being depleted at an enormous and alarming rate. Israel still has a very serious conflict potentially ahead of it with Hezbollah. Whether or not the Israelis strategically want to have that war, it will probably be thrust on Israel anyway, despite that, you know, I, I believe it can be a strategic opportunity, but but I'm not sure Israel is going to be uh, given the luxury of even deciding whether that, that will happen. Uh, and, and that will burn all the rest of Israel's Iron Dome missiles. Uh, there's uh, really serious issues with artillery and 155 millimeter shells. Th there's an issue of a lot of production. It, the Israeli military was surprised also in terms of stockpile. So I believe that uh, the United States will have to play a very great role after the war, after the war, after Israel's proven it can win this war alone and delivers a 67 lot level traumatic. And I, I, I emphasize the word traumatic victory on its enemies. Uh, but then the United States becomes critically important. One, to defend it in the international system from laws, uh, from, from the courts uh, and uh, the UN Security Council, and B, to help Israel stockpile rapidly uh, its, its, uh, its missiles and so forth, because uh, Iran, the, the, even if it's thrown on the defensive, will still have, uh, unfortunately, a tremendous source of, uh, of funding from its deals with Russia, China, all the oil it sells and the sanctions that are not being enforced on that. And so, so until the international community actually gets serious about sanctions, Iran will have hundreds of billions of dollars of cash infusion just by selling the oil. Uh, and Israel will be faced with what? They have to rearm with what? So uh, those are the moments at which I think the United States and its alliance with Israel are, are most critical. But during the war, absolutely imperative that Israel emerges from this having delivered its own victory. It needs to own that victory. Yeah, on that, uh, on that note, owning victory, which is a, a term we haven't heard recently uh in these areas uh the, the whole concept of military victory has changed that's a subject for a totally different but very important discussion about the concept of victory opposite radical islamic and palestinian terror organizations and even uh, marxist Leninist terror organizations uh and, and it's all part of a shift in conception so in the we will have that conversation because we are very blessed to have dave worms as a fellow of the jerusalem center for public affairs Hope everyone will join us. I know there are questions by Lenny Bendevin Perry uh, that uh, regarding Kerry's uh, refusal to, believe, to to understand Iranian involvement and, and Lenny's important question about German activists and so on, but we're way over time. And I really appreciate, we really appreciate the patience and attentiveness of our, of our audience. We normally would like to invite you to comment uh, and question and ask questions, which you normally will do after 30 minutes. We went over because of the uh, the depth and breadth of the commentary by Alan and, and Dave and Maurice. And we're, we're just delighted to have you. We're going to do this again tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, and we have uh, we have an equally exciting program, I think, with Jack Neri. We have Jack Neri coming. We'll, have, we'll feature Khaled Abel Tuame, who's a fellow Jerusalem Center, as well as Jack is. And, and Khaled will provide us with deep insight what how the Palestinian leadership is thinking, even the PA and the Hamas, uh, uh, and uh, how Israel can respond. Uh, so stay stay with us. Look at our website, jcpa.org. And we'll, we're going to have a, an area where you can support us. We need we really need your support in any denomination to enlarge this war room and to invite many scholars, practi practitioners, uh, intelligence people, diplomats, uh, Middle East experts, former government officials. We're going to we have the finest here at jcpa.org. Tell your friends about it. We want to have hundreds of people every day, and we're we're taking steps to build the most uh, robust uh, wartime diplomacy center anywhere.